And so tonight as we close the chapter and the book of Ruth, we read from Ruth chapter 4. And I want to invite you to read with me from Ruth chapter 4, verse 1 to 10. Meanwhile, Boaz went up to the town, up to the town gate, and sat down there just as the guardian redeemer he had mentioned came along. Boaz said, Come over here, my friend, and sit down. So he went over and sat down. Boaz took ten of the elders of the town and said, Sit here, and they did so. Then he said to the guardian redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from Moab, is selling a piece of land that belonged to our relative Emelech. I thought I should bring the matter to your attention and suggest that you buy it. In the presence of these seated here and in the presence of the elders of my people, if you redeem it, do so. But if you will not, tell me, so I will know. For no one has the right to do it except you, and then I am next in line. I will redeem it, he said. Then Boaz said, on the day you buy the land from Naomi, you also acquire Ruth the Moabite the dead man's widow, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property. At this, the guardian redeemer said, then I cannot redeem it because I might endanger my own estate. You redeem it yourself, for I cannot do it. Now in earlier times in Israel, for the redemption and transfer of property to become final, one party took off his sandal and gave it to the other. This was the method of legalizing transactions in Israel. So the guardian redeemer said to Boaz, buy it yourself. And he removed the sandal. Then Boaz announced to the elders and all the people, Today you are my witnesses, that I have bought from Naomi all the property of Emelech, Kilion, and Malon. I have also acquired Ruth the Moabite, Malon's widow, as my wife, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property, so that his name will not disappear from among his family or his hometown. Today you are my witnesses. This is the word of the Lord, and thanks be to God. And so this chapter of Ruth can be described as the love chapter, something that would have just been settling of land or the transfer of property is complicated in the stories of Ruth, Naomi, and Boaz by matters of the heart. And so what we find in this chapter is something very common that is taking place. It is something that is called the kinsman redeemer. And what happens in the story is that Boaz goes to the town gate where he finds the kinsman redeemer. The city gate was where the officials, the esteemed, and the prestigious people of the city sat. But it was also a makeshift outdoor court where judicial matters were often solved. And so that's all it should have been that day, the settling of a judicial matter. And so what happens here is the exchange between Boaz and the guardian redeemer. And they're negotiating the terms of how this redemption is going to look. This guardian redeemer concept that we find here was a law that was given to the the people, to the Israelites, as a way of taking care of their people, even when tragedy hits. So if you're really curious, at home tonight, you can go read Leviticus 25. It's quite a long passage, and it explains the whole concept of redemption. If this, then that. If this, then that. And you can go read all about it. But in short, it's just a transaction that would happen between the closest male relative and the person who's, who was the widow of the one who had passed away. And so the law declared how this transaction would go. But what we find surprising at this point is that there's land, that Naomi has land. Because up to this point, this remains a mystery to us. Up to this point, we think that they are in a foreign country, or for Ruth, it's a foreign country, for Naomi, it's her hometown, and They have nothing. They live as beggars in their own country. And so what we find here is that Ruth and Naomi have land. But the land was not their own. Because the way society was structured was that women needed men to survive. They could not inherit land. They needed a man to inherit the land. And so even though this land actually belonged to Naomi, it did not belong to her. She was in poverty in her own country. And someone would need to save her. And so we think tonight, why sell it? Just keep it. Plant some crops and you'll be okay. You know, some of us, especially the woman, might think, come on, lady, be resourceful. Don't rely on a man to save you. But the system wasn't designed in this way that 
women could not save themselves. And so the role of the men and the guardian redeemer was not just to keep the property in the family, but also to look after the persons and the posterity or the lineage that would follow. And so what we find here is the exchange that happens between them. Land was never permanently sold in the Israelites. It was never meant to be permanently sold. So when the Israelites crossed over the Jordan into the promised land, the land was divided among the tribes. And then in the tribes, each family group would have been given a part of land. And so this land was supposed to stay in the family. But when you found yourself without, you could temporarily sell the land so you could get something for it and then be redeemed by your relative. Fifty years later in the Jubilee year, as they called it, all the land would be returned to the people. And this would kind of clean the slate and even out things again. And so, like I said, the role of the kinsman redeemer was not only to look after the property of the family and to keep it in the family, but also the persons and the posterity, the lineage to follow. And so, what we see happening first is a pure land transaction. When Boaz presents it to the kinsman redeemer, he says, here's the land, will you redeem it? And the guy goes, yeah, sure, I'll do it, I'll do it. And then Boaz says, but with the land comes Ruth and the future lineage that will follow from her. They're a package deal. You can't take the land without Ruth. They're a package deal. And so he goes, uh, I, can't, I can't do that. And so what we see here is this man probably had sons already at this point. We assume he's married, and he probably had some sons. And what would have happened is his inheritance would then be split up among those sons. Again, daughters wouldn't matter in this because inheritance could only be, be given to a son. And so this would have been given to the sons, but if he married Ruth, not only would his family situation be complicated, but also any future kids he would have with her would have to then get a portion of the inheritance. And so like all people try and do, we try and get away from the mess, away from the complication. And so what he says is, I cannot redeem the land. And in doing so, he actually misses out on a chance to be an ancestor of Jesus. And so upon refusal, Boaz gets to marry Ruth. Now, this is something that we can assume is not just out of duty as the kinsman redeemer then, but also out of love. And we can kind of see this in the way that he pitches this this deal to the kinsman redeemer. He almost first says land, and then he angles it this way so that he knows he will say no. And upon refusal, he can then marry Ruth. What amazing love. And so what's so amazing about this book of Ruth is that it not only gives us an historical account of the story of Ruth and Boaz and Naomi, but it also tells us a lot about ourselves and how God sees us. It tells us a lot about God's love for us and what God's love looks like. And so there's three things that I'd like to highlight for us out of this tonight. And the first thing is that God's love is a prevenient kind of love. God's love is a prevenient love. Prevenient means that it goes before or goes ahead of. And so what this means for us is that God gives us his love before we even ask for it. It is a love that is given to us before we even come to realize that God exists or before we're interested in him, that we have God's love. I recently read the story um, about a little girl who was adopted into a family. And before she was adopted into this family, she belonged to another family. She was part of another family that had adopted her. But what happened in her old family is when they went on holiday, the biological kids would go with the parents to Disneyland, and this little adopted daughter would be given off to family friends, and she would not get to go with them to Disneyland. And so when she was adopted into the new family and her new dad heard about this, he decided he was going to take her to Disneyland. But what he didn't expect is her behavior leading up to the time where they went to Disneyland. Someone who was normally quite well behaved suddenly became rambunctious, she became mischievous, and she really started acting out. And so the one night when he pulled her onto his lap to reprimand her, she very dryly said to him, I know what you're going to do. You're not going to take me to Disneyland. And so he realizes what's going on and he says to her, is this a trip that we are taking as a family? And she says, yes. Are you a part of this family? Yes. And so weeks later, they go to Disneyland, and they have the best time. 
And that night when he's tucking her into bed and he asks her about her first experience of Disneyland, she very tearily says to her dad, Daddy, I finally got to go to Disneyland. But it wasn't because I was good. It was because I'm yours. And so is the love of God for us. It's not because we're good or because we have to do something to earn it or because we do something to deserve it. But it is simply because we are God's. Because God created us. So even when we don't acknowledge that we are God's, because he is the creator of all, God above all, we still have his provenient love with us. And so even before we become conscious of God, he is with us. Personally, I can see that in my own life, that before I became aware of God or conscious or able and old enough to even realize that God was alive and that he was mine, God was loving me and protecting me. Now, anyone who knows me quite well will tell you that I have a bit of a fascination with the meaning of people's names. And so often when I meet you for the first time and your name sounds interesting, I'll ask you for the meaning. And I think it comes from me really treasuring the meaning of my name, although people get it wrong all the time, they spell it wrong all the time. Ilza means the Lord has mercy or God is bountiful. And so naturally, the first place I started when I researched for this is the meaning of names. And what I was very surprised to find is this incredible message of love that is waiting for us to discover it in the genealogy of this family. So if you trace the descendants and you trace their names, you find this incredible message of love. You see, our lives are only a glimpse, a breath in the great span of eternity. And sometimes because of the short time that we have to meet God and to get to know God this side of heaven, we fall into the trap of thinking that God's provenient love is not real and that God doesn't really care about us at all. Sometimes we look at the history of Ruth and we say the only reason it worked out well was because Ruth took matters into her own hands. But that's not true. It's because God was with her this whole time. And so as we trace the genealogy and we check generation from generation, we see God's provenient love with them. And so we start with Naomi, and Naomi means pleasant. And so this reminds us of the time where God and people were together, and it was pleasant, and all was well with them. But what changed was tragedy in their lives. And so when tragedy hit them, they lose their Imelech, meaning God is my king. And so they no longer see God as their king, and believing that God has forgotten them, they live lawless lives. And in their lawlessness, they go from Naomi to Mara, from pleasant to bitter. And that is the fate of our story. And so we find hope in the unlikely, humble Ruth, meaning friend or companion. And that reminds us of the constant companion that God is to us, the love of God that exists with us before we even ask for it. And then we find Boaz, meaning in him is strength. In him is strength. And that reminds us that no matter how bad our situation is or gets, in God is strength. And finally, we find Obed, the son of Ruth and Boaz, meaning serving or worshiping. And this for us is a foreshadow of the one who would come as our kinsman redeemer, our Jesus Christ, son of man who came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life to redeem many people. And so the provenient love of God in Christ shows us that God is at work with us, even when we don't realize it. There's a beautiful quote I'd like to share with you tonight, if we can put it up on the screens, and it's by a British theologian called Derek Kidner. And it says, God's hand is all over history. God works out his purpose generation after generation. Limited as we are to one lifetime, each of us sees so little of what happens. A genealogy is a striking way of bringing before us the continuity of God's purpose through the ages. The process of history is not haphazard. There is a purpose in it all. And the purpose is the purpose of God. And so the thing about God's love is that God did not wait until we realized he existed or was interested in him before he gave us his love. But 
from before you are born, you have God's love with you. And so in every part of your life, and I hope that your life is kind of playing through your head like a movie right now, in every part of your life, God's love is with you. In the times where you were not interested in God, wanted nothing to do with Him, wanted to shout at Him, God, where are you? You don't care about me. In the times where God felt so far away that it further wouldn't be possible, God's love was with you. And so because of this amazing love, we have the assurance tonight as well that nothing, nothing can ever, ever separate us from the love of God. And so we find that in Romans 8 verse 38 to 39, it says, For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, neither the present, nor the future, nor any powers, neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ our Lord. The second thing that we see about God's love tonight is that it is a redeeming love. It is a redeeming love. Not only do we see that in the picture of the kinsman redeemer, that Christ, our kinsman redeemer, comes to redeem us from our dire situation, but we also see it in the incredible story of Ruth and in her own life. Like I mentioned last week, Ruth is a Moabite. And so what this would mean is that she unfortunately comes from the incestuous line of Lot. And so these were a people that because of their history were so despised that Israelites were told to have nothing to do with them, let alone marry them. But then we see at the end of this book that Boaz goes on to marry Ruth with a clear conscience. And that is because she is redeemed of her blemish history. But this has nothing to do with Boaz. This has to do with the work of God in her. You see, what we often miss in this chapter, in this book, is the heart change that is happening here within Ruth. The redeeming action of God in her heart. As a Moabite, Ruth would have worshipped the Moabite god called Shamash. But there is a shift in her heart. If we look for it, we find it. And we often miss it. So in Ruth chapter 1, Ruth says to Naomi, Don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. And the famous lines that they use at the wedding. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people. And listen for it. And your God, my God. And so not only was Ruth committing her loyalty to Naomi, but also to the God of Naomi, who was the one true God. She says, I'm going to leave my history behind. I'm going to leave the God of the Moabites behind. And I choose the one true God. And I think it's our human nature to almost doubt if it's possible to really leave things behind and walk away from it. But we see that it is possible, and we see that in that Ruth leaves everything to follow Naomi and follow God. John Wesley says, he that forsakes all for Christ shall find more than all with him. And so I wonder tonight, what is that one thing in your own life that sometimes makes you doubt if God can truly redeem you? What is that one thing that makes you wonder, does God still love me, even though I've done, even though I am? Can God really forgive me? Perhaps it's an addiction. Perhaps it's an unconfessed sin or an habitual sin. Whatever it is, friends, let me assure you that God is a God of redemption. He is a redeeming God with redeeming love. And so God says to each of us, come now, let us settle this. Though your sins are like scarlet, I will make them white as snow. Though they are like crimson, I will make them white as wool. And so even when it seems like we are beyond hope, because of our pasts, our choices, our mistakes, God's redeeming love can and will change everything if we ask for it. And so our last thing tonight is the invitation that each of us has, and that is to a committed love. 
No matter what you've done, you are assured that God loves you. And that you can be redeemed from that. That you can, like Ruth, walk away in a different direction, knowing that you leave your past behind you. And so tonight we are invited in the same way as Ruth to a committed love, to have a committed love for the Lord. It is a commitment that says to God, God, be my God. And then we can be assured that we are forgiven and that we are redeemed. Once Ruth made the commitment to God saying, your people be my people, your God will be my God. The sins that once overwhelmed her, her past, her fears, her worries, she left them in the mighty hands of God. The burdens that she once had to carry, so heavy, were now gone. Her hands, once so full, now empty, able to embrace God and raise her hands and worship. Something that I've found myself doing over the years when I find Myself, beyond the point of words, trying to explain to people why I feel the way I feel or how I feel, or even when I can't pray and say, God, this is bothering me. I picture myself holding those things, sometimes not even able to name it or hold it. But I picture myself holding it. And then I throw it up to God, and I picture God catching it and saying, I'm holding it now, just like I've been holding you all along. And then my hands, once so heavy, once so full, are free and empty to raise in worship to God. And so I want you to hold on to that picture tonight. That no matter what it is that is so heavy for you, give it to God. Enter into a committed love. And then there's one final thing. That if we choose to love God... We make a commitment to something more. And once again, we find this in that same short passage. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. You see, because loving God and loving God's people is a package deal. We cannot do one and then not do the other. It's a buy one, get one free. It's a package deal. And so Luke 10 verse 27 says to us, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and, that and is very important, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. And so part of choosing to love God with that committed love is choosing to love God's people. And friends, it's not going to be easy, I assure you. Because loving God's people includes all genders, all nationalities, all races, all personalities, all religions, all orientations, and more. But it is loving God's people as we love God. And so if we really want to faithfully follow God and commit to loving God, we have to love God's people. It's a package deal. And so Ruth shows to us the blessings obedience can bring. Ruth was a nobody. She was someone who, according to Israelite tradition, would not even be written into Scripture except as an enemy because she was a Moabite. Instead, she is written into Scripture today as one of the few women whose stories is mentioned, but also as someone who is part of the chosen people of God, the people that God chose to bring His Son into the world as a human. She was once a nobody, and she becomes the great-grandmother of David, the great ancestor of Jesus. And so if this is the story of a simple Moabite widow who could have had a very different story, what has God got in store for you? If we choose to love God, to say, God, I choose to live those, leave those things behind and follow you with a committed love. What has God got in store for you? And so tonight, I'm going to ask that we spend some time in silent prayer as we each respond to God. 
Like I said last week, my role as a preacher is not to give you the answers. It's not to tell you what to do, but it is to help you find an opportunity to listen to God and answer the questions that God is asking you. And so, please, take the time tonight to respond to God. For some, it might be the first time that you feel led to respond in a certain way. And so we'll have a prayer up on the screen for you if you want to use that. Or perhaps you just want to sit and think about what God has triggered in your heart tonight from what we've spoken about. But please, take the time now to respond to God. And so I invite you now to pray with me. Loving God, each of us here tonight knows the story that we walked into these doors with tonight. We know our history. We know our fears. We know our worries, our pains, our joys, our suffering, our story. Thank you that you are God who knows that story and says, despite that, I still love you. A God who loved us before we even came to realize, before we even asked God, your love surrounded us, held us, protected us, and cared for us. Thank you, God, that we can come before you with our stories and say, God, take this story. Take these burdens out of my hands. Wash me white as snow. I'm so unworthy, God, but make me clean. God, take my burdens, hold them and hold me now. And may I be free to raise my hands in praise as I choose to follow you. God, as we come to realize the call that you have for us to love your people, it's not something that's easy to do, God, and, and you know that. But God, give us the heart, give us the strength to do so to love all people as we love you. And so I want you to take a moment now just to respond to God in your own way. Whatever that looks like for you, please take the moment now, just in the short time of silence, to respond to God. We thank you, God, that you hear us. You hear the silent voices of our hearts. You hear us when we cry out. And even when we don't have the words, God, you hear us. We thank you for your amazing love. We pray this in your mighty and your powerful name. Amen.